evening everyone. Welcome back. We have another episode of Nerds of the North. Finally. I know I've been away for a while. Uh, personal issues and couldn't get my equipment to work properly. Equipment settled. It's now working. It's time to catch up on some stuff. So let's get started. Wheel of Time, Book 6, The Lords of Chaos. This book is absolutely incredible. Now, there's so much that goes on in this book. This actually was the book that caused me to stop reading Wheel of Time when I was in high school. I could not get through the prologue. No matter what I tried, I could not push myself through that prologue. It's It was just, I found it boring, I couldn't get into the characters, couldn't get into the story, and that's really disappointing because the prologue sets up so much but so much more happens in this book that you have to push through. If you're getting bogged down on Lords of Chaos, push through. So what do we have happen here? Well, we have uh, we have Elaine and Nynaeve catch up with the Rebel Eye Sedai in Saladar. End up staying there with them and trying to... Trying to continue doing the work the Armalin sent them to do, but at the same time, now they're stuck listening to what the Little Tower, as they're calling it, is telling them to do. And what where does that get us? Well, we get, first of all, on their arrival, Elaine has her warder, Brigitta. Tom and Julian come with her. Some of, They bring some other refugees with them. One of which is hiding in disguise, and it is discovered through a trip into uh, Teleran Riyadh. Actually, what am I thinking here? That all, that all happened in Fires of Heaven. Oops, sorry. So in Fires of Heaven, they found out that you had this, this hidden, this forsaken, hiding amongst uh, the... Uh, the refugees that they brought into town. Well, now we're in book six. They have her collared with a idom, and they're presenting new technologies, new weaves, new discoveries to the tower. Now, these are all discoveries that they've managed to weasel out of Mogadi. Mm, they did. They've done pretty pretty well for themselves. Until Nynaeve decides to create her own discovery. She's pissed off one day. Surprise, she has to be pissed off to channel. She's pissed off. She goes and sees Loghain. And tries working on the fact that he's been stilled. And with a sudden shock, Loghain's eyes bolt wide open. And Nynaeve draws every single last ounce of power she can. Throws a shield onto him and... Pretty much wails at uh, Elaine, go get Shiriam, because Nynaeve has just healed the stilled Loghain. Loghain is now back to full power as a channeler. This brings up a pretty comical scene of Shiriam and a bunch of other members of the tower showing up. They believe her, they don't believe her, they chastise her, they praise her. They're doing everything they possibly can to piss her off, to keep her mad. Because when they get her off into another room, another part of the tower, or another part of Saladar, sorry, in come Suan and Liana. And finally understanding, Nynaeve does what she did before in front of all the yellows so the yellows can see, or as many of the yellows that were fit in the room. She heals Suwan. She heals Liana. The reactions that happen are incredible. Now, there's a difference that we note here. When using Sayadar to heal Loghain, who channels Sayadeen, she healed the full strength. However, Sayadar to heal Sayadar doesn't work that way. Suwan and Liana have nowhere near 
their old strength. Makes me... I remember sitting there reading that part in the book going, get one of the Ashaman. Get... Show, like somehow teach the Ashaman the weave. Link with the Ashaman so he can sense or figure out what the weave actually is. And use Sayadeen to heal Swan and Liana. Bring them back to full power. Might not have worked, but that's what I kept thinking. Then we get a interesting ch chapter. Um, I can't. I think it's called Summons or something like that. Um, Elaine, sorry, not Elaine. Egwene is summoned before the Hall of the Tower through Teller and Riyadh through a meeting there, and. At this point, she has to explain to the Wise Ones that I've been masquerading as an Aes Sedai. I'm actually only an Accepted. Uh, and she gets them to help her meet her toe. Which, if Elaine, if Egwene didn't do this, it's not that she would have lost the Wise Ones' respect, but she so much happens later on because Egwene has such a strong connection with the Wise Ones that... If she didn't do that moment of meeting her toe, I don't know if it would play out the same way. Once her toe is met, she thinks she knows how to get to Saladar in a hurry. By stepping into the world of dreams and the flesh. She's figured out how to do this. She does so. She shows up in Saladar within two or three hours. They weren't expecting her for a couple of days. So, that was quite fast. Um, what is Egwene summoned to the hall for? To be raised the next Amerlin seat. And it's really funny, because the Tower, or the Saladar people, believe that they have raised a trophy Amerlin. Someone that they're going to be able to control. Well, when they get Suan to teach her the ways of the Armorlin, they learn very, very quick, or Swan learns almost immediately, Egwene will not be controlled. She is Armorlin. She's taking control. Your will is going, she's going to bend your will to her own. The Hall's not expecting that, and it turns out to be fantastic fun. Because uh, she starts playing the Hall against each other, getting the stuff to work out the way she wants it to. She vocally just announces that Nynaeve and Elaine will be raised to Aes Sedai status. They don't have the oath rods, so they can't raise them formally. There's still the matter of the testing, but what the Amerlin says is law. So, she's the Amerlin, she said it. To deny the fact that Nynaeve and Elaine are Aes Sedai is to deny the fact that Egwene Alvir is the Amerlin. That's quite the play. We then have uh, Matt and his band of the Red Hand showing up in Saladar at Rat's, at Rat's Rand's command to um, bring Elaine and Egwene out, and Nynaeve too, if she wants to come along. Only Egwene ends up using the fact that Matt showed up with his band of the Red Hand to force the Saladar folk and the army Gareth Bryn has gathered to get underway and start moving towards Tarvalon. Now, while this is going on, Telmanis is, con is in control of the band, because Matt, who has sworn to Rand that he's not leaving Elaine's side until she's on the Sun Throne, Lion Throne, sorry, until she's on the Lion Throne, follows Nynaeve and Elaine and Avienda to... Ebu Dar to search for the Bowl of the Winds. Now, Ebu Dar is an interesting place. Very interesting place. Uh, definitely a place I wouldn't want to go to myself. Uh, it is a seafaring port city, but it's a very small country, Ebu Dar. Uh, and it's Duels. Duels everywhere. Duels all the time. You're never safe out on the streets. So it's good that, you know, Elaine has her warder with her. Matt has the band there with him. 
Uh, Oliver ends up tagging along. That's a lot of fun because they end up getting Oliver uh, to race. Although I think that's more in the next book. Yeah, forget that. That happens in the next book. Now, the, one of the last things I remember from Lords of Chaos. I remember a, the two chapters, The Sending, and, well, there's a chapter before The Sending. I don't remember what the name of it is, but I remember The Sending a lot, the end of the previous chapter, and then do, the last chapter, Do My As Wells. These three chapters together are absolutely incredible. The gist of what happens is Rand thinks he can control the Aes Sedai. He's dealing with the Aes Sedai emissaries from the White Tower. He's dealing with the Aes Sedai emissaries from Saladar. What he doesn't understand is that the leader of the Red Aja, Galena Kazban, is part of the Tower Aes Sedai. And she's more than she seems. Yes, Galena Kasbin, head of the Red Aja. Galena Kasbin, also, as you would recognize from this symbol here, forcing your thumb deeply through the first two fingers of your hand, you are a member of the Black Aja. And a very high member from the sound that we're led to believe. Well... Rand tries to send them away. He thinks he has the upper hand. They actually play him for a fool. They bring, they secretly bring 13 Aes Sedai into his presence, shield him, force him into a trunk, and walk him out of the Sun Palace in Karian. They take Min along with them from the hotel, and they leave. They start their trip to um, Tarval. Now, Galena's under instructions from the Armorlin, uh, Elida. Sorry, I'm drawing a little bit of blank on the name. I just usually call her the bitch, because I hate Elida. Uh, Galena's under instructions from Elida to make Rand pliable, to get him more agreeable. Galena's way of doing this is by beating the crap out of him. And when the beatings on him weren't working, she decided to beat Min. That didn't work out so well. Because Rand snapped. He broke out of his bonds, killed two warders before they managed to stop him. Which meant that now, for the rest of the trip that Rand is in that box, he is kept in a box, throughout the heat of the day. They pull him out at, when they stop traveling for the night, hit him with a bucket of water, beat the living snot out of him, force a little food into his mouth, tie him up like a goose, and he sleeps. Then when they wake him up in the morning, feed a little bit of food to him, beat the living snot out of him again, and put him into the box. And... That's how Rand travels from the Sun Palace towards Tervalin. They, um, Perrin discovers that Rand is missing because Bear Lane finds Rand's sword left behind. Rand doesn't go anywhere without his sword, especially not his sword and the dragon belt. He never goes anywhere without it. The maidens know this. So she finds it. Berlane. And she brings it before Perrin. And, uh... I believe it's Dobrain in there as well. However, there's another person there in the room. We have... Oh, I'm trying to think of the, the Aiel girl's name. It starts with an S. Sulin. We have Sulin, who's currently serving as Rand's personal maid to meet her toe. When Bear Lane walks into the room and Sulin sees the dragon belt and sword, she lets out a wail, screaming, What have they done to my brother? 
because Rand is daughter of a maiden, therefore brother to all maidens, or son of a maiden, therefore brother to the maidens, as that's how they see him, brother slash son. And while they're trying to calm Sulin down, that's when she just snaps, like, you do not remember, for I wore different clothing. And she spins, maiden hand talk flashing, summoning for cotton sore to be brought, scissors so she can trim her hair properly. Sulin is back as far to rise my. And Perrin has decided, that's it. I will not let them have Rand. Summon what forces we can. We have Ruark, who summons... I think he brings about 5,000 men, 5,000 Sesuayaman, because that's what he said all he was allowed to bring was Sesuayaman. But he also brings almost a 1,000 maidens with him. After warning the maidens, don't bring, you dare bring anybody, everybody, I'm allowing you this many. All the wise ones who are in camp, I believe it's 92 of them, show up and follow. You have, um, the winged guard fra show up. We have, um, D we have Dobrain's forces, and we have Arganda's forces showing up on the march as well. And this is where the Sending chapter begins. They're marching out of the city secretly in small groups. Um, Loyal is going with Perrin, of course. We have Aram with Perrin. And they're ready for war. They're going to track them down. The first night, Perrin's got to figure out just what direction these guys are going. How far ahead the Aes Sedai are ahead of him. He does it the one way he can. He knows possible. He drifts off into the wolf speech, lets his mind wander, and talks to the wolves. We seek Aes Sedai with men in wagons who are ahead of us. And through ex explanations and different sendings being passed down the line, Perrin discovers that there is a camp of Aes Sedai 70 miles ahead of him. And that's where they're heading. Uh, that's so things like, okay, 70 miles ahead. We're going to keep on. We're going to track them. The last question he ever wanted to answer gets asked by one of the wolves. Why? Perrin cares very deeply about the wolves. It's the same that he cares about for the Two Rivers men. So taking a deep breath, Perrin... Sends his mind out with the simple terms. They have caged Shadow Killer. The wolves know Shadow Kill, no Rand is Shadow Killer, the one who will stop the shadow. The shock, the outrage, the the horror that comes back down the wolf bond through him is matched by hundreds of howls peeling off into the night. Not 100% sure as to what this is all going to mean. All the, all the answers that are left to him from the mind is, We come. So the wolves are matching, marching with parents' forces. Not with, but more alongside them. As they're, tra as they're traveling along, they're pushing game out of the forest so the men don't have to enter the forest and bother the wolves. It's just incredible. And this, as this journey is going on, Perrin picks up um, the Two Rivers men, and they have seven or eight Aes Sedai with them. Perrin also has a couple of Aes Sedai brought with him originally. And this is where they meet up with Varen and Alana, and they gather them all into the forest. They keep going, and suddenly a wolf, the wolves are like, Come, come now. Many two legs. Many, many, many. Come now. That's where the sending ends, and we start Dumai's Wells, the last chapter. This story, this chapter is told from the point of view of many points. Uh, we have Gawain Trakhand and the younglings with the Aes Sedai who are stealing Rand. We then have Perrin's point of view. Uh, then we'll have Rand's point of view as well. So... 
it starts off... Galad's marching along. One of his scouts comes back with a mortal wound, dies as he delivers a message. Aeel, thousands of them on all sides. So they fortify themselves off at Dumai's wells. Three stone wells and a little copse of trees. They bring the wagons in. They fortify themselves up. And next we hear from Perrin. He's looking down into this horrific battle. I said I are defending with the one power. The wise ones from the Shido are using the one power as a weapon against them. Wise ones don't do this. They walk through blood feud and war without engaging. That's what they're allowed to do. No, Savannah has them attacking the Aes Sedai. But there's 40,000 Shido. Nowhere near the force that parents brought. And all the commanders are laying on the top of the ridge looking down just disheartened by what they see, and Perrin's like, I don't care. We're going in. You don't like it? Leave. I will not let them have Rand. We get the best charge ever. We have them all crest up to the hill. Get ready to... They start moving down. And as it's, as they're advancing on the forces, the, narrator, the author, or Robert Jordan, has written down the paces, so you know how far, how close you get. 700 paces. The Two Rivers men, uh, everybody's getting ready into positions. 500 paces. The Two Rivers men dismount, walking their mounts. 400 paces. The Two Rivers men readying their bows, because they're once they hit 300 paces, the Two Rivers men are going to stop. 300 paces. Lord Dobrain draws his sword, holds it up high, screams a battle cry. The Lord Dragon, Taborwin, and victory! And a thousand lances snap down as the Carrianen charge at 300 paces. Perrin just has time to grab onto Dobrain's stirrup and letting the horse pull him along in leaping bounds. Loyal is pacing side by side with the horses easily in, a, in the charge. The Aiel are sprinting down the line seconds before they hit. Perrin sends his mind out. Come! And suddenly the, the plains around them give birth to a thousand wolves who just appear out of the grass, launching themselves into the backs of the Shido. The Shido turn around to engage the wolves in time to see... A solid spear of Aiel slam into them, along with a hammer of carrion and lances, as the arrows launching from the sky start raining in beyond Perrin's forces into the Shido. The first volley's hitting as the second volley's already high in the air. The battle is on. Perrin's fighting with one purpose in mind. Clear the bramble. Clear this debris. Clear a path and get to Rand. That's all that matters. However, there's so many Shido. They end up getting boxed in. Perrin and Loyal and Aram fighting side by side by side. The wise one are the I, sorry, the Aes Sedai are walking through, waiting through combat. Uh, fires from their own hands, launching forward on, as three warders are dancing around them, cutting, clearing a path for them. And suddenly, a loud boom happens in the distance. At that moment, black doorway gates spring open, slicing through men, slicing through Shido, as black-coated figures with swords leap out, some of them going down to Shido's spears. They begin laying about them with the swords, and Sayadeen. Mazram Taim has sent the Ashaman in to help save Rand, and Shido are just ex. Exploding. Some are being burned, some just, their heads are going, <laughs> drop. Simplest forms of channeling could do. They, these guys are brutal. It's disgusting when you read what it is. Like just, it's horrific, the battle damage that's being caused. And at this point, we switch over to Rand, trapped in a box. Constantly feeling at the six soft points of his shield, praying, 
trying to get his way through, trying to talk with Louis Theron. Suddenly, one of the points goes hard. Then another. And another. Four points total go hard in the link. And Rand begins. Louis Theron's freaking, no, no, they'll feel it, they'll feel it. Rand can't wait, he's got to do it. Weaving himself through the knots of Sayadar, infinitesimal small spaces, he weaves something of himself through until he's on the other side of the knot, and then he flexes what he put through, and the knot rips apart. The shield's still there, but now it's only five thick. Works on the second knot, four thick. Third knot, three thick. Freaking out, he has no other choice. He has to do something. He launches himself at the last knot, praying that he can cut through it in time. And he manages to do it just in time. He cuts through that knot before another sister can come in to hold the shield. Still three people holding the shield. He reaches towards the source through the shield. It's bending, it's bending, and then the shield rips apart before him. He grabs onto those three soft points that were still holding him, crushing them in fists of spirit. Only can channel where he sees, so he channels air. Boom! The box explodes from around him. As the chest explodes out from Rand, he's scrabbling around the ground, trying to force the body to move. Yes, the power makes him feel strong, but his body is broken. He manages to cut his way through. He rescues Min, he gets off with, um, gets up with her help and continues on moving as a cut purse, as he describes it, around the clearing, striking at Aes Sedai, shielding them, knocking them out with air. And then each Aes Sedai he drops, more lightnings begin to fall among the camp, some fireballs begin to land their way through. Less Shido are being stopped from getting in, and then Boom! The Shido break through the lines. It's chaos everywhere. He has a quick encounter with uh, Gawain as Gawain tries to get Min free. Um, they pretty much stare each other down and then Rand is happy that uh, Gawain leaves without having to kill him. However, one of the Ashaman shows up and tries to stop the uh, younglings from getting away. Uh, Rand beats him to the ground with a mace of air and then he the Ashman gets up, spins on Rand, ready to attack him, and at this point, Taim shows up. Uh, oh, you would not strike at the get at the Dragon Reborn, would you, Gedwin? Taim uh, controls, uh, gets everything set up. The Ashman come in, they control the camp. Barric a barricade goes up, multiple um, weaves of air to create this big barricade to fence off the entire uh, top of the campsite, protecting Rand. Perrin and Loyal are there, some of the Aes Sedai are there, um, Sulin is there, Loyal's there as well, Aram, they're, they're safe, but the problem is, stuck out amongst the camp are other members, other maidens, other Shai, other, um, Siswayaman, other two, all the two rivers men, the wise ones, and he doesn't, Rand doesn't want the Shido turning on him. Perrin um, voices this, and thinking that Rand's going to be so callous and just let them die. Uh, finally, Taim's just like, well, we're not going to do that. Like, I can open up a hole in the gateway, and you, these guys can go out and try and fight, try and help them, to send a message. Rand's not having that. He's just, no. Taim, I told you to make weapons. Show me how far you've come. Now, this is the most memorable scene from Lords of Chaos, in my opinion. Ashaman! Form line of battle! The Ashaman, who aren't guiding or guarding um, imprisoned Aes Sedai, form up at the edge of the barricades in a complete ring around the camp. Time's voice is enhanced with the power. Rand's standard is hanging up through a smoke hole at the top of the barricade so people can see it. Hopefully that'll tell all his, all his friendly members to fall back and get out of the way. 
Asherman, raise the barricade two spans! The barricade comes up approximately seven feet. The Shido that are throwing themselves into it to stumble forward as suddenly it's not there. Before they get more than one step, it's time's next command comes out. Ashaman! Kill! And the front rank of Shido explode. Just body parts everywhere, sprays of blood as bodies are ripped asunder. The weaves snake off through Shido, next, 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 just causing this wave of explosions. As the Shido begin to turn and run, trying to flee from what they cannot fight ahead of them, Taim's command changes to Rolling Ring of Earth and Fire, which is concentric rings spreading out from the top of Dumai as well as of earth and fire spraying up into the air, and it chases after the Shido for 100, 200, 300 paces before Rand is finally able to call Taim off. Ashaman, rest! The Shido are broken. They are running in fear. Perrin is off to the side, emptying his stomach. The other eye, the other eye eel aren't looking at the carnage around them. They've turned their back to it because it is such a horrific scene. It was no honor in this fight at all. They've died from in contact with the power, dying to something that they cannot fight. Rand congratulates the Ashaman while still in the void, so he doesn't have any emotion in his voice, and he's never been so thankful for that. At this point, the Aes Sedai who accompanied Perrin walk up to Rand. He's like, Well, Rand El Thor, I see that you managed to free yourself. We did come to rescue you, but you seem to be done all right on your own. However, intentions do count, so... But Rand is... Done with Aes Sedai. After his treatment at Adelaide's emissaries, he is done with dealing with any Aes Sedai. So he turns around to her and is like, Aes Sedai, I told you you'd be on an equal terms with the Tower emissaries. And for I told you, you could bring no more than three into my presence. I count nine. For bringing nine, you will be on equal terms with the Tower Emissaries. They are on their knees, Aes Sedai. Kneel! And she, the Aes Sedai is like, What? You want us to do what? The Ashaman all around them are holding Saedine, ready to attack. The warders are on edge. And you get the most spine-tingling moment. As Taim walks up. Kneel and swear to the Dragon Reborn, or you will be knelt. And as from the prophecy, on a day of blood, the, t the unstained tower broken bends knee to the forgotten sign. Well, let's look at this. On a day of blood... Okay, well, that's just what happened in Dumai's Wells. It's understandable. It's massive slaughter. The unstained tower broken. The white tower, and it has been broken because there's now a rebel. There's the towers and there's the rebels. It's split right in two. Bends knee to the forgotten sign. Rand marches under two banners. The banner of the dragon, of Louis Theron Telamon. And the banner of the ancient symbol of Aes Sedai, the black and white disc. They bend knee to the forgotten sign. And it is this point that the first Aes Sedai swear fealty to the Lord Dragon. How is that for ending a book? This is, I got to this moment when I first did my read through or my listen through on the audiobooks. I was walking to a friend's house while this was going on, with my friends who have been telling me, finish the Wheel of Time. I stopped outside his house while Dumais Wells was going on, because I didn't want to stop the chapter. And he's, he comes to the door and he's looking at me, he's like, what are you, what are you doing? I, I can't even answer him, I'm just in a daze. And when I hear the term, when I finally hear it, 
so ends the sixth book of the Wheel of Time. I pull up my iPod, I hit stop, I look up at him and go, Okay, you're right. He kind of looks at me for a second and says, like, What do you mean I'm right? He's like, That was book six. And he just has this big grin on his face. He's like, it comes down to one word. Or he can say, oh, really? Yeah. Do my as wells? And I'm just, oh, my God. I told you. I told you you needed to read through book six. So, yeah, if you can make it through book six, definitely, definitely do it. If you ever want to even get a sampling of what the, the audiobooks are like, Listen to The Sending and Dumai's Wells. Those two chapters alone will convince you or not whether or not the audiobook is worthwhile. Because they're so well done. Just getting to hear the action and everything play around you, it was absolutely incredible. Anyways, up next, we've got a crown of swords, so stay tuned. I'll get that video up shortly.